2018. My name is Tom Wilsinger Friesen, and on behalf of CPLA, which is the Christian Perspectives in Liberal Arts Committee, I want to just thank you for coming tonight. So uh, we have as our special guest Dr. Russell Howell, who you heard at chapel this morning. And uh, I'm sure that you know by now that the topic for our focus series is chaos and order. And you know, the more you start looking around, uh, the more evidence you can find for chaos and order. At least that's what I've been. You know, just the fact that you're sitting here tonight, your bodies are here, is because our, our bodies have systems that operate in an orderly way, our, our heart beats regularly, we have predictable chemical reactions, all those kinds of things. But chaos is never far from the surface. So errors in DNA replication, you know, they're just a tiny fraction, but they can result in diseases that can harm, um, but they can also result in mutations that enable uh, such diversity, wonderful diversity in our natural world. So uh, chaos can destroy, but it can also yield a whole lot of fruitfulness and beauty. This summer kind of hit me, this whole chaos and order thing. I just out of the blue got struck down with a pretty serious medical thing, and um, it sure felt like chaos. And, <laughs> But over the, the time and through prayer and doctors, I've come to see even a new order may be emerging there. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for God, which we read in, in uh, the eighth chapter of Romans, that God works in all things for our good, even in chaos. So I'm also thankful for our speaker, Dr. Cowell, in chapel this morning. You uh, heard him remind us of spiritual disciplines from scripture that can help us survive and even flourish in times of anxiety and chaos. So tonight, he's going to examine how mathematics might connect with a theistic worldview. And just as a heads up, there'll be time for questions afterwards. So I hope that you will jot some ideas down or keep them in your head and, and we'll have Q&A time afterwards. Dr. Howell holds the Kathleen Smith Endowed Chair of Mathematics at Westmont College in California. He's an accomplished author and scholar, having taught all around the world. Um, for example, the US Air Force Academy, Oxford University, Mexico, just to name a few. He's been awarded Westmont's Teacher of the Year honors twice. And over the last couple of days, as I've gotten to know Dr. Howell, um, a few things have struck me. He models that same kind of humility that he recommended to us at chapel this morning. And uh, for him, he brings this deep love of learning, deep Christian faith, and these two go hand in hand in his life. So would you please welcome him with me, Dr. Russell Howell. scheduled to deliver a one-hour lecture. 
and said to a chauffeur, I can't really speak. Look, you've heard me give this lecture 25 times or so. You've probably got it memorized. And in any case, I've got the entire manuscript here. All you have to do is just read it. <clears throat> the chauffeur objected. But Einstein said, look, you know it takes exactly one hour. There will be no time for questions, so you don't have to worry about fielding any questions. Reluctantly, the chauffeur agreed. They both showed up at the venue. Einstein came as the chauffeur and sat in the front row. The chauffeur delivered the talk. But of course, he was a little nervous. And so finished in 50 minutes rather than 60. The moderator then got up and said, well, Professor Einstein has allowed us for 10 minutes of questions. How wonderful. Are there any? And of course, immediately hands went up. And one person in the audience asked an obscure question with technical terms that are almost impossible to reproduce. And in answering that question, the chauffeur was struck with a flash of insight. He said, you know, that question is so simple, even my chauffeur here can answer it. And he answered it to Einstein. So, if there are any questions like that, I will pass the mic off to one of my chauffeurs. And hopefully they'll be able to answer it. One of the books that C.S. Lewis wrote is called Miracles. It was first published in the first edition in 1947. And his aim was to map out a philosophical framework that would be compatible with the notion of miraculous events. Such events, of course, are not viable in a naturalistic worldview. That is, a view that leaves no room for God. And in chapter three, Lewis produced an argument designed to show that naturalism was, as a philosophical system, incoherent. He called it the self-contradiction of the naturalist. And it created quite a storm. It finally led to a debate with the philosopher Elizabeth Anstrom at the Oxford Socratic Club. It took place February 2nd, 1948. Anstrom was a Catholic, so of course she was no naturalist. She just felt that the arguments that Lewis gave against naturalism were not compelling. And the consensus seems to be that Lewis was better in that occasion. That assessment was, was confirmed to me by Michael Dennett, who attended the event. He was actually there. I had an appointment at Oxford for a year, and this is when he and I were in front of Wolfson College, and I put the question to him quite directly. Do you think that Elizabeth Aston actually beat Lewis in that debate? Oh, there's no doubt about it. She just trounced him, was his response. Well, he actually phrased it a little more delicately as in British book versus word. <laughs> Many have argued that that debate shook Lewis's confidence in his ability to engage in philosophical argumentation. Um, I don't think that's right, um, because Lewis rewrote chapter three for the 1960 edition of the book, and he even renamed it the cardinal difficulty of naturalism. So I think that suggests that he took Lewis's uh, criticism seriously, but he was still not afraid to set out an apologetic. If you compare the other two editions, this 47 and the uh, 60 edition, they're remarkably similar. He toned down and tweaked some arguments, but one important difference was he spent some time uh, drawing out two ways that we use the word because. For Lewis, the first way is as cause and effect. So one might say, grandfather is sick today because he ate spoiled food last night. That's the cause of his being sick. The other for Lewis is what he calls ground consequent. So someone might say, grandfather must be sick because he's still in bed. The person knowing that grandfather usually gets up early is now making an inference. That's what Lewis calls ground consequent. Now, curiously, the same kind of issue was raised by the physicist and eventual Nobel laureate, Eugene Bigger. He wrote he was someone who lived in a completely different world from Lewis, being a physicist. Indeed, 
And it's well known that Lewis struggled with mathematics and science generally, much to his regret, I might say. And Baker's article, ironically, also appeared in 1960, the very year of Lewis's second edition. But his intention, Vickers, was to raise an interesting aspect of mathematics that, as far as the article went, had nothing to do with naturalism. On a closer inspection, though, you'll see that it does. And we'll see that the spin-offs from the ideas of Wigner and those of Lewis are intricately linked with the success of mathematics. Wigner's article bears the title the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. And it begins by a story about two friends who were discussing their jobs. One of them was a statistician who was working on population models. He mentioned a paper he had written which contained a co complicated looking equation on the first page. Probably that. The, stat the uh, statistician attempted to explain the meaning of the various symbols and uh, the friend was increasingly nervous. At one point, the friend says, what is that symbol here? Pointing to this one. Whoa, that is pi. And what is that? The ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. Well, now you're pushing the joke too far. Surely the population has nothing to do with the circumference of the circle, so said Baker's friend. Wigner uses this story to introduce two important questions. Number one, how is it that scientists use mathematics so well and so often to build successful theories that relate to the physical world? And number two, how can we be sure that completely different theories would not be as successful as the ones now in use, though perhaps concentrating on different phenomena. For those of you that might be familiar with the work, with the work of Thomas Kuhn, this sounds much like his ideas. Regarding Wigner's first point, he conceives that much of mathematics, such as Euclidean geometry, was developed because its axioms were created on the basis of what appeared to be true of reality. For example, Euclid's very first axiom says, it's possible to draw a straight line between any two points. Yeah, sure, that, that just seems to be the way things work. From this viewpoint, the applicability of mathematics is hardly surprising. But how much of mathematics actually progresses in that manner? A good argument can be made that other factors guide the formation of a large body of mathematical theories. Take the field of complex analysis, which is actually my area of research interest, as just one example. It grew up, it started really in the 1500s. Uh, the notion of complex numbers, though, even though it started then, was very problematic because it involves taking the square root of minus one. And in that time, negative numbers by themselves were still being treated with some suspicion. So all the more with the idea of taking square roots of those numbers. But mathematicians kept using their imagination and pretended that complex numbers made sense. They developed logical theories that would account for these numbers. But this process took time. Do you know it really wasn't until the end of the 1800s that complex numbers finally became firmly entrenched in the corpus of mathematical literature. And it's important to, to note that no physical phenomena drove the acceptance or the emergence of complex numbers. They were simply logical consequences of axioms that mathematicians worked out. Now, however, complex numbers play a pivotal role in helping physicists understand the quantum world. And for Whit Binger, the early use of quantum mechanics led to a miracle. It arose when Max Born, Werner Heisenberg, and Pascual Jordan decided to use mathematical constructs known as matrices to, to represent the position and momentum uh, variables and equations involving classical mechanics. Later, Wolfgang Pauli successfully applied this technique to the mechanics of the hydrogen atom. 
Now, Wigner states that this success story was not surprising because the matrix procedure was abstracted from problems dealing with the hydrogen atom in the first place. But then, matrix techniques were applied to the helium atom. There was no justification for this move, says Wigner, because the calculation rules were meaningless in that context. Yet, the application worked remarkably well. According to Bigger, here's what he says, the miracle occurred when the calculation of the lowest energy of helium agreed with the experimental data within an accuracy of the observations, which is one part in a million, in 10 million. Surely, he says, this is the case where we got something out of the equations that we didn't put in. Wigner cites other examples. Newton's laws of motion, formulated in terms that, appear, that are apparently simple to mathematicians, but which prove to be accurate beyond all reasonable expectations. Or quantum electrodynamics, and the pure mathematical theory of the land shift. The thrust, we don't need to understand those terms necessarily or what they're talking about, but the thrust of Wigner's point in all of this is illustrated by comments he makes both at the beginning and near the end of his paper. Early on, he says this, the enormous usefulness of mathematics in the natural sciences is something bordering on the mysterious, and there is no rational explanation for it. In concluding his paper, he says, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will extend, for better or worse, to our pleasure, even though perhaps to our bafflement, to wide branches of learning. You know how many times Wigner uses the word miracle in his paper? Twelve times. Sometimes you get the sense that really, by using it, he means nothing more than phenomenally surprising. But at other, at other times, you get the feeling that he's pointing to something deeper than that. Now, what exactly is a miracle? Lewis defined it as some kind of interference with nature by a supernatural agent. And Lewis described a naturalist as someone who thinks that nothing exists except nature. So for Lewis, there are no supernatural powers, and therefore, no miracles. Now, admittedly, the, the meaning of the word nature needs some clarification. And Lewis spent some time doing that in that chapter. And I sort of think that the term interference is a bit awkward for theists like me who think that the laws of nature are just general descriptions of God's continued sustaining power over creation in the first place. Lewis was no doubt aware of these difficulties, but going into extensive elaboration would have beyond, been beyond the scope of his chapter. And likewise, I think those definitions are going to work well enough for our purposes today. Now, curiously, that was in 1960. There was no formal response by the mathematical community to Victor for 20 years. But finally, in 1980, the well-known computer scientist, Richard Wesley Hamming, took up the task. Like Victor, Hamming was, Hamming was impressed with the success of abstract mathematical theories. He had used them in his formulation of an algorithm now known as the Hamming Code. Any computer scientists here that might have studied it? It's an algorithm that is used to detect and possibly correct errors when data are transmitted from one computer to another. Hamming's goal was to take the unreasonable effectiveness question applied to the title of Wigner's paper. And he offered four partial explanations that account for the applicability of mathematics. First, scientists see what they look for, according to Hamming, and they craft postulates so they will produce theories that conform to their prior expectations. That's sort of like Wigner. 
Because scientists look at the world through a mathematical lens, it's not entirely surprising that they wind up describing it in mathematical terms. Second, scientists select the kind of mathematics to use. The same type of mathematical theory does not work everywhere. Different theories are selected in accordance with the phenomenon that they seem to describe. All right, those explanations are kind of similar, and they're somewhat reminiscent of Kuhn's question about whether the theories are just the result of our efforts or whether they're really onto something, whether they fit our perception of reality. But look, not all applicable mathematical theories are generated out of a concern for applicability, so further work must be done, and Hemming has some additional food for thought. His third response is a little bit surprising. Science actually answers comparatively few problems. To the extent that this assertion is true, the less of a miracle the success of mathematics would appear to be. Wigner, as a physicist, certainly lived with mathematics as an indispensable tool, but other scientists do not share the same reliance on mathematics. Biology, it's often said, has not yet been successfully dissected by the mathematical scalpel. But whether this observation is true, and that claim about biology can be legitimately debated, it is not help in answering Wigner's main concern. That is, the success of mathematics in physics itself is something that needs accounting. And so Hamming gives a final response that seems to be an obvious mechanism for doing just that. It is that evolution can explain why mathematics is successful. Now, Hamming just mentioned that, mentions that as an option, but doesn't flesh it out really besides this comment. Darwinian evolution would naturally select for survival those competing life forms of life which have the best models of reality in their minds. Now for Darwin, best means best for surviving and propagating. Let's briefly look at some evolutionary models because they tie in with Lewis's analysis in miracles. Because time is limited, I'm just going to talk about two. The first explanation can be called the sexual selection hypothesis, as argued by Jeffrey Miller. He claims that excessive capacities or acquisition of resources of any kind may be a sexual display. If one has the energy or time or intrinsic capacity do, that do not have things that have direct adaptive value, like carrying around a big set of antlers, that are more of a hindrance or than they are a defense, or walking around with a big colored tail like a peacock does. At any rate, if you have artistic or mathematical abilities that are more than needed to solve the problems of survival, then according to myth, that energy or time or intrinsic, intrinsic capacity by itself will attract mates and thus increase survival in terms of propagation. Now, physical attributes certainly seem to have a role in mate attraction, and artistic brains may as well, insofar as they enable people to make attractive artifacts for display. The argument for mathematical brains, however, doesn't hold up quite as well. Although Miller does not specifically address that issue of mathematical reasoning, there's been some speculation that his thinking might be relevant. Here's what he says. The healthy brain theory suggests that our brains are different from those of other apes, not because extravagantly large brains help us to survive or raise offspring, but because such brains are simply better advertisements of how good our genes are. But how would such a brain, such a larger brain, be evident? And why would such advertisement be appealing? In this regard, one is reminded of the cartoon by Gary Larson. It portrays two men competing for attention of women on a desert island. The one winning the day was able to produce a more impressive array of mathematical equations on the chalkboard. 
So I don't mean to be making fun of that one. It just reminds me of that cartoon. And I think a lot of evolutionary biologists say that, look, you can't disprove those speculations, but there's no good evidence to support that theory, at least as it might relate to mathematical thinking. There's another person in the interest of time I'm going to pass over, Pascal Boyer, who has a byproduct hypothesis that is similar to the next one. He argues that mathematical uh, knowledge is a byproduct of other that isn't adaptive, but it's a byproduct of other things that are adaptive. And it's reminiscent of the module hypothesis, which is argued by Stephen Mithen. Mithen writes from the perspective of an anthropologist. And he has, if you read his books, he's got an enormous amount of archaeological data on which to draw. As I said, he's thinking is similar in many ways to Boyer. He states that integrative, higher level, cognitive capacities grew out of the unification of specific evolutionary modules, such as a module for tool use or a module for interpersonal relations. These modules seem to coincide with spurts of drain enlargement, which are caused by a variety of factors. For example, Mithen says this, in general, larger animals have larger brains simply because they have more muscles to move and coordinate. Mithen further argues that in humans, and only in humans, we find a structure on top of these modules, a general all-purpose rationality. So he says in summary, in science, like art and religion, it's a product of cognitive fluidity. It relies on our psychological processes which had originally evolved in specialized cognitive domains and only emerged when these processes all worked together. All right, Mithen and others who argue along these lines pay into a detailed and perhaps plausible scenario, but if the scenario were to be cast in a naturalistic framework, where all we have is blind chance, then it is precisely here where Lewis, in writing his third chapter of Miracles, wanted to put on the brakes. His concern was actually directed against any evolutionary account or any evolutionary theory that would be set in a naturalistic framework where all the relevant forces involved are nothing more than random, blind chance events, and thus with no oversight at all by any kind of supernatural being. So, no miracle, if you please, in Lewis's terminology. Let's now return to his argument, which relies on his claim that human inferences are logically connected thoughts and are vital components of our reasoning. But how does one thought cause another? With a view that parallels the logician Gottlob Frege, uh, Lewis writes, one thought can cause another only by being seen to be a ground for it. Lewis then thinks it is inconceivable that a raw chance natural selection which operates solely by rewarding biological responses that enhance survival or reproductive proliferation. In other words, cause and effect responses as opposed to ground consequent responses. He thinks it's inconceivable that cause and effect responses could nevertheless be transformed into acts of insight. Now Lewis's views on this matter remain controversial. In fact, on February 2nd, 1967, precisely 19 years after the Lewis Anscombe debate, John Lewis, the philosopher, engaged Anscombe on Lewis's argument again. And again at the Oxford Socratic Club. By the way, that club is no longer in existence. This time, though, the consensus seems to be that Lewis successfully defended the thrust of Lewis's thinking. So it is a popular view and can be defended even among philosophers today. Incidentally, uh, as part of a Templeton program, I went and visited John Oxford. He's a very eccentric character. So he took me for a ride in his 1927 Humber. It was delivered in 1928. 
John Lucas, would, uh, once I sent him an email asking him if he could do something, and he signed, he indicated yes, Isaac, I-S-A-A-K. And I asked him, what do you mean by that? If still alive and kicking, was his response. <laughs> in fact, in 1957, when Lucas was only 29 years old, he tied two balloons to the front struts and across the bumper sticker wrote, Happy Birthday, because the Hummer was 70 years old. And, I'm sorry, in, in 1997, when Lucas was um, 48, I think it was, or 49. He did this and he, I'm 70, he put a sign on the Hummer and rode around town with these balloons. Only to his chagrin, he got a, a, a call from the vicar saying, well, congratulations on your birthday, John. Thinking about a 49-year-old was actually 70. Didn't go over very well with him. All right, so enough of that. Uh, but there are other philosophers one can name who are sympathetic. Uh, Victor Recker expanded Lewis's ideas in his book, C.S. Lewis's Dangerous Idea. And finally, Alvin Plantinga has generated much discussion with his argument that is similar to Lewis's that naturalism is self-defeating. Plantinga, though, gives a probabilistic analysis. He notes, as Lewis did, that evolution selects for survivability or reproductive pr proliferation. But to use Hemings' language, even if evolution favors life forms that have the best models of reality in their minds, best is still defined, and indeed it must be defined, by success in surviving or propagating, not necessarily cognitive reliability. But wouldn't the former success of reproduction or proliferation wouldn't the former imply the latter, cognitive reliability? No, not according to Planica, who spends some time arguing that it is reasonable to suppose in a hypothetical world that a high degree of survivability and reproductive proliferation could be found among creatures like us, yet whose beliefs are mostly false. And ironically, many naturalists argue that Belief in God, though false, is a highly survivable trait. Therefore, for Planica, the odds are either low or inscrutable that our cognit cognitive facilities are reliable, given the tenets of evolution combined with blind chance naturalism. So any naturalist reflecting on this state of affairs would not have confidence that her cognitive faculties were reliable. But then she should not trust the validity of naturalism itself, a theory that was created by cognitive processes like hers. As Darwin himself commented, with me, the hard doubt arises whether the convictions of a man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust the convictions of a monkey's mind? If there are any convictions in such a mind? Now, Fleming's argument has not convinced many naturalists. But however his or Lewis's line of thinking finally plays out on that particular issue, we, we can see uh, why their arguments or how their arguments against naturalism beautifully fit into a Christian theistic worldview. Because that framework naturally justifies trust in the reliability of our cognitive processes. We were not created by blind chance. And by whatever process God used to create us, he did so with the desire that we would come to know and believe in him. Rendering it very likely that the belief producing processes from which Christian belief emanates are indeed reliable. Okay, now the stage is set, as promised, to show how mathematical elegance also poses problems for naturalism in ways that parallel Lewis's thinking about beauty. Let's suppose that a blind chance evolutionary theory will be able, eventually, 
to come up with a plausible explanation of the reliability of our cognitive faculties, notwithstanding the arguments of Lewis and others challenging that possibility. Let's suppose they do that. If so, any such theory, coming as it does with a naturalistic worldview, would still run up against the arguments of Mark Steiner, author of the book, The Applicability of Mathematics as a Philosophical Problem. We'll be discussing Steiner's argument more on aesthetics than he does. But strictly speaking, Steiner attempts to refute non-anthropocentrism rather than naturalism. If Steiner is correct, however, the naturalist should not take comfort for any form of naturalism Steiner uses is ipso facto non-anthropocentric in that it would disallow a privileged status for humans in the scope of the universe. If, as Steiner argues, the success of mathematics can be shown to put humans in some sort of privileged position, then naturalism has some problems to sort out. How does mathematics do that? Well, for Steiner, it's not so much the success of any one particular mathematical theory after all, there have been many failures in mathematics. In this regard, Steiner agrees with Hemming's third point, science answers fair, relatively few problems, and is critical of Wigner's approach in citing specific success stories from physics. The use of pi by the statistician in Wigner's opening lines ignores all the failures in attempting to predict population trends. What Steiner's talking about is the success of mathematics as a grand strategy. It's a strategy that takes, for example, formalisms of complex Hilbert space theory and then boldly uses them as a tool to make predictions about the quantum world. Predictions that subsequently seem to be borne out by experiment. How is this phenomenon anthropocentric? Well, maybe an analogy would be helpful. Most cultures use a base 10 numbering system. There's no universal agreement why that's the case, but the general consensus is that it has to have to do with our having 10 fingers. And incidentally, the Mayas use base 20, which further confirms the appendage counting hypothesis, if you will. Now, what if successful theories of how the universe operates were based on multiples of 10? in a fundamental way. That would be anthropocentric in an extreme. The only reason the number 10 is special to us is due to how we appear to ourselves, anthropocentric. Suppose further that not only did the number 10 have special significance, but time and time again, other human aesthetic criteria played a significant role in understanding the universe. Surely, such occurrences, when looked at from a meta level, would make one wonder why this privilege seems to fall on the human species. Yet this situation is precisely analogous to what mathematicians and scientists actually do when they rely on human notions of beauty and symmetry in the development of their theories. In fact, such an activity has been a long-standing and consistent strategy. Galileo, for example, pursued this tactic even though the best empirical evidence at the time did not necessarily support, and indeed in some instances it tended to disconfirm his heliocentric theory. He adopted it because it was more elegant than the Ptolemaic model. Many physicists generally admit that elegance, beauty, and symmetry hold primary sway in theory development. Brian Greene, author of The Elevant, Elegant Universe, argues this way. Physicists tend to elevate symmetry principles to a place of prominence by putting them squarely on the pedestal of explanation. The well-known British mathematician G.H. Hardy, in his book A Mathematician's Apology, delineates criteria for good mathematics, and he argues that they are driven primarily by aesthetic criteria such as economy of expression, depth, unexpectedness, inevitability, and seriousness. 
qualities that seem to form standards for good poetry. Two of these criteria, expectedness and inevitability, or unexpectedness and inevitability, appear paradoxical when taken together. In a beautiful ma mathematical theory, there's certainly the inevitable. A mathematical theory, there are marches to a conclusion that you just can't deny. But how can something inevitable also be unexpected? The answer lies in the proof of the theorem itself. A beautiful proof has ideas that take the reader by surprise. Somewhat like a series of beautiful moves, I suppose, in a chess match. And surprises, when put in context, become stunningly beautiful. I think a good poem has the same effect. The pattern of words form a symphony that contains many of surprises, to, to be sure. But at the end, paradoxically, it almost seems inevitable that it had to be stated the way it was. Lewis believed that poetry could reflect God's character in creation. And in some sense, Lewis might say that our earlier use of the phrase human aesthetic criteria was a bit of a misnomer. For Lewis, our ability to judge something as beautiful is a sign of our bearing God's image because these judgments point to an absolute beauty. So Lewis, the books or music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we treat them, if we, if, we, if we trust to them. It was not in them, it only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never visited. There is a close connection between beauty and goodness in Lewis's thinking. In Miracles chapter 5, he sees the moral judgments we all naturally make as posing further difficulties for naturalists, thereby extending his argument from reason into the realm of value theory. It is not that the moral pronouncements of naturalists are incoherent. It's that, on their own view, they can only legitimately be regarded as sentiments and not genuine expressions of thought. Steiner, too, sees something special in our aesthetic preferences. His book contains several examples of beautiful mathematical theories, and we might say that subsequently and miraculously wind up being used in applications to the political world. His survey includes the use of complex analysis in fluid dynamics, relativistic field theory, thermodynamics, and quantum mechanics. One of his examples is, is worth exploring in some detail. I had two, but I'm going to skip over the first one. It's well known among mathematicians and physicists, and it's the second example that you see right at the bottom, Maxwell's anticipation of a physical reality. See how nice I am on sparing you of all those equations there. So that last point, Maxwell's anticipation of a physical reality. In, 19, in 1871, James Clerk Maxwell made a remarkable prediction arising in his work with electromagnetic magnetic theory. He noted that the experimentally confirmed laws of Ampere, Coulomb, and Faraday, when put in a certain form, known as their differential form, contradicted the laws of conservation of energy and electrical charge. Rather. How could this contradiction be resolved? Maxwell decided to tinker with a mathematical equation that represented Ampere's law. He eventually realized that if he added a term to it, the resulting operation or equation would not only be consistent with the conservation of charge law, it would actually logically imply it. With no other experimental evidence or warrant of any kind, Maxwell then made a bold prediction. His new term would be found to correspond with some physical reality. Maxwell died in 1879. Nine years later, Heinrich Hertz 
demonstrated the reality corresponding to Maxwell's term, electromagnetic radiation. Richard Carrier, a freelance writer and science historian, is unimpressed by this episode. And he claims that what Maxwell did is entirely consistent with naturalism. First, Carrier states that Maxwell's putting laws in differential form conforms to the naturalistic observation that nature works in continuous, not broken, processes. Second, Steiner argues that Maxwell took a logically sound hypothetical step. If charge isn't being observed, then it must be going somewhere. Presumably that's what led to the addition of this term. Maxwell, and then Carrier states this, Maxwell, right, Maxwell rightly picked the simplest solution imaginable first, which due to human limitation is always the best place to start an investigation, and which statistically is most likely, as simple patterns of behaviors happen far more often than complex ones. Thus, Maxwell's moves that anticipated electromagnetic radiation were therefore a natural conclusion from entirely naturalistic assumptions. But with such language, Carrier plays into Steiner's hands. Taking a simple solution in accordance with human limitations is precisely analogous to using the number 10 as a means for unlocking the secrets of the universe. It is quintessential anthropocentric. One wonders if it is difficult for people who are not practicing scientists to appreciate the absolutely uncanny ability of the continued use of mathematical formalisms by physicists. Ryan Green, the elegant universe author by contrast, seems to agree with Steiner's main point. At least unconsciously, physicists have abandoned a raw naturalism in favor of a theory formation. formation that has principles of beauty embedded in its core. If they are correct, this approach appears to be an anthropocentric, and we might say, by implication, non-naturalistic strategy. Or, could it be naturalistic after all? Might it not be argued that a plausible evolutionary model could be devised that would explain, for example, human preferences for symmetry. Such constructs seem reasonable or possible, especially considering symmetries that might be adduced in examining our DNA code. But even if some model could be developed that would explain our preference for symmetry, how would a blind chance form of such thinking explain why such preferences work? After all, magical incantations are symmetrical, but they hardly work. At least three static strategies seem possible at this point. The first is to argue for some kind of probabilistic weighting mechanism that would drive physical processes towards the production of sentient life forms and do so in such a way that their preferences for symmetry and beauty coincided with the actual mechanisms of the universe. A second approach would involve an appeal to a primal basic position. Just what happens that the universe evolved in such a way that notions of beauty work successfully in theory formation? And finally, one might argue, along with the lines of Wigner's Kuhnian-like question, that what we call success came only because humans have invested a great deal of energy into science over the last 500 years. Who is to say that, if similar energies have been funneled in a different direction, there would be operating today a totally different paradigm, yet with the same degree of, quote, success. The success could be due just to effort, and not necessarily to some amazing connection humans have with reality. These are, of course, huge issues, and it would be presumptuous to think that we could settle them in the space of this one-hour talk. Uh, nevertheless, we can explore very quickly some possible answers. First, with respect to the probabilistic weighting hypothesis, one might legitimately ask where the evidence is for this claim weighting. As Keith Ward comments, author of the book God, Chance, and Necessity, 
a physical weighting ought to be physically detectable. And it has certainly not been detected. In this sense, a continuing causal activity of God seems the best explanation of the progress towards greater consciousness and intentionality that one sees in the actual course of the evolution of life on Earth. Furthermore, if some kind of weighting could eventually be hypothesized and then tested, it may still be asked why such a weighting is biased in favor of humans. To a theist, there is no prima facie reason why God could not work with what appears to be chance, although the problem of determining exactly what one means by chance is by no means trivial. For a theist, that the position humans seem to have of being able to understand the workings of the universe is by itself the result of the creative and purposes of activity of God, even if our coming to be this way arose out of some kind of probabilistic weighting scheme. Next, the primal basic notion. Well, they're needed at some level, but invoking them in an effort to account for the apparent privilege status of humans in the universe. This is just the way there is, and no more needs to be said. That appears akin to pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Um, a naturalist may, in good conscience, choose that option. But for a theist, again, the conviction that human notions of beauty and symmetry relate successfully to our knowledge of how the universe operates reinforces all the more the belief that human creation is the result of the purpose of activity of an intelligent being. Theum theism makes excellent use of the epistemic power of aesthetic criteria. Let me say that one more time because I stumbled a bit. Theism makes excellent sense of the epistemic power of aesthetic criteria. And finally, the idea that our constructs of success are ad hoc appears to be an objection with no realistic alternative. It essentially says, well, your theory makes sense, but only if one buys into some of your commonly accepted cultural notions. Other unspecified theories would be able to show that the success that you claim is really arbitrary, perhaps merely a form of social agreement, and thus not privileged. Well, okay, but such a position, to me, almost shuts down discussion. You know, of course it's possible that other theories could be successful, but where are they? And more to the point, the effort expended by mathematicians and scientists in developing their elegant theories can more plausibly be looked at as evidence of bumping into a real world rather than constructing one. Many times, scientists have tried to explain observed data with a particular theory in mind, only to have reality thwart their attempts. As John Polkinghorne observes, who at this time was referencing the unexpected but extremely useful byproducts of the Dirac equation, it is this remarkable facility that persuades physicists that they are really onto something. And they, they are not tacitly, just tacitly agreeing to look at things in a particular way. Furthermore, why is it the case that mathematics seems to be universal across cultures? As the mathematician and historian Glenn Van Roman has observed, pre-modern China, whose mathematics was virtually independent from the rest of the world, has the same theorems and conclusions, an impressive list found in other cultures like ancient Greece, including the Pythagorean theorem, the binomial theorem, the solution of polynomial equations by Horner's method, and the Gaussian elimination for the solution of systems of systems and equations. So it seems to me, in conclusion, that a theistic explanation might well be the best one to account with the continuing success of mathematical theories that ultimately grow up out of human aesthetic criteria. As Lewis himself observed, the disorderly or complex world which we cannot endure to believe is the disorderly or complex world he would not have endured to create. In assessing these arguments, I hope that we adopt an approach similar to the one suggested by Victor Record 
in his defense of Lewis's thinking. There are, of course, valid points to be made by people who disagree with these ideas, which should not be looked on as dogmatic pronouncements, but as a catalyst to weigh various options. I think human aesthetic values and their subsequent use in successful physical theories dovetail nicely with the Judeo-Christian view that humans are created in the image of God. Whatever being in God's image exactly entails, it seems to include a rational and aesthetic capacity reflective of his that enables to humans to understand and admire his creation. While not necessarily the final answer, such a perspective can be, in my judgment, confidently put on the marketplace of ideas for appraisal, which is what this talk has attempted to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Howell. Let's open up the questions. Questions. Remember my chauffeur was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It could have to do with math, chaos, order, any of these um, topics. Maybe I'll start off with one, but you have to be thinking too. So um, it seems, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but it seems like the approach here that you presented, which I thought very, very well even though it's taken me a while to process, um, it views it, it could view order in an entirely positive way and chaos in maybe more of a less positive way. That's maybe granted so much. But when I'm thinking about technology and how mathematics seems to be used in building algorithms and uh, you know Amazon.com and how do they know what to charge? I came across one time on Amazon where uh, there was a, a box of Splenda for $1,200. <laughs> and uh, so I had to take a screenshot of that. It, you know, obviously these algorithms go wrong but sometimes, but by and large, they're using mathematical formulas to um, create order. And um, maybe an objection might be raised that order can be stifling or um, used to control. Um, those are just some random thoughts, but do you have any thoughts on, say, order, chaos, and technology, and maybe how we as ordinary people are less connected to those kinds of, uh, that order that underlies um, algorithms and that. I don't know if I've... Can you ask? Probably not. Yeah. Um, do you think that folks are rightfully concerned um, that math allows people to create ways to control rather than allow for human freedom? I don't know if that gets anything. Okay. I don't know. Is this working? That's really such a simple question. I want my chauffeur. <laughs> well, um, at Westmont, that's a big concern of one of our computer scientists. So um, he's in artificial intelligence, and he is worried that we will create these systems that ultimately coerce people and get wrapped up in sort of a mindset that leaves out the Christian notion of service. So I'm not sure if I'm addressing your question. Um, I do know that there are books out technology being stifling. There's one I was talking about, someone at lunch, I think, um, I mentioned this, there's a book out that argues that loneliness is now more of a severe illness than depression, cancer, and alcoholism combined. And that the loneliness is created in part because people have more virtual friends than they have real friends. And that this virtual island has led people into a depression, which then contributes to alcoholism and the like. 
I don't even know if I'm doing a good job in the ballpark. In the ballpark, good, good enough. Yeah, Tom. If I if I understand correctly, you see your equation beauty and order. Is that is that reasonable? Is it not reasonable? I know you may. Let me just ask the question then. Okay, I, you can correct my. Well, let me just a quick response. Sure. It's beauty is used to generate theories that explain the disorder that that create order in some sense. Say that one more time. Beauty is used as a criterion or measure for generating mathematical theories that then are used to predict how nature works. So okay. beauty and order are not correlated, but beauty is used in, as the basis for what, what gets to be deemed as good mathematics. It's beauty. That's what I would so, so I guess I'd just like to speak to that, the, you know, the, the mathematical beauty of the equation of the Gaussian distribution, which describes, as far as I understand, uh, disorder, randomness, statistics. How do you, how do you uh, I guess, deal with that tension? Yeah, yeah, so we talked about this a little bit in the car. Um, my view of uh, some process that's random is a process that's infinitely irreducible. Okay. So think of something that's random. Yeah. I think a good definition of a random process is something that's infinitely irreducible. So the digits of pi are not random. They're infinite. There doesn't seem to be any pattern but you can reduce it to an equation that will generate it. So if something random is something that's infinitely irreducible, and I think that God might be involved in that randomization. You know, there's nothing that I can prove that way. But that these mathematical theories that we use somehow mysteriously can help explain the randomness, at least in terms of a probabilistic. We can't nail it down exactly, but we can say, Look, there's a probability that things are going to be here. I don't know, am I doing it? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you did as well. Um, just a follow up then. Does uh, randomness exist? Boy, <laughs> where's my chauffeur? The question that I was asked by Dr. K does randomness exist in the universe? Well, you know, you're a physicist, but so I guess at the quantum level, it seems like it might. Which is confusing to me then because there are equations that are used to describe that randomness. Yeah, right. Although, again, the, the equations are just probabilistic judgments, right? So, for yeah. example, the probability is such and such that a particle is here. We can't say for sure where it is. Yeah, right. Good questions. Comments? as far as they can. 
They have to be careful, though, if the explanations don't degenerate into a naturalism and don't allow, at some level, the working of God as a person, purpose of God. And that's what Lewis is arguing. Yeah, yeah. So here's what Lewis finally got and others that point the line picture record is what we say. So naturalism, what does that mean? There's no just one chance. So what survives according to Lewis and Flanagan? Well, it's things that are good, reproductive proliferation and survival skills. But that doesn't necessarily relate one to one with cognitive reliability. So what they're asking for is can you come up with a theory that explains why cause and effect responses, you touch something hot and you draw away from it, why cause and effect responses can translate into ground consequent responses. That's what Lewis calls reasoning. How can those blind chance mechanisms lead to that? Now, my argument was, there, maybe there is a way to do that. So I'm not going to say, Lewis, my golly, you're right, you defeated naturalism. I think it was an interesting argument. Did, did you understand my, that part of the answer? No. No? No, no, All right, so you touch something and it gets hot and you drop it. That's cause and effect, right? But you have an inference that grandfather must be sick because he's still in bed. That's not a biological response for Lewis, not a biological cause and effect response, right? So if you just have things that evolve with these cause and effect responses, you might have, in, in Flanagan's words, uh, a certain creature might run away from a lion and escape in danger and survive, but the creature might think that he's running towards the lion. I don't know, I don't know how plausible that is. He might think the lion is a big teddy bear and he's running towards it and actually he's running away from it. So what he's trying to do is develop a framework where survivable mechanisms might actually generate beliefs that are false and not does that so what I think there might be a way to explain it evolutionarily with the with the blind chance processes, but still I find a bit of an implausible argument of then how do you account for the fact that our preferences for human symmetry relate to explaining the universe. Now, now it's not it's not an argument. So Lewis would say, look, there's different kinds of apologetics. There's apologetics that won't convince a non-believer, but for a believer, looking at the argument, you go, yeah, that fits so well. It must be true. That's kind of the way I look at it. It seems to fit so well. It just gives a better, comprehensive, more satisfying view of the universe than the Does that be honest with me about that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, the question in case you here, can you elaborate on how little mathematics explains in the natural sciences? Yeah. yeah. Because we know so little about mathematics, how can we decide that you can't describe so little? Because we know so little about mathematics, how can we decide? Because mathematics is not really drawing from all the aspects of mathematics, how can we prove that it just explains so little? Are you asking why did Hamming say that mathematics answers comparatively few problems? No. Yeah. Well, you might disagree with Hamming. And you know what I said was, okay, maybe that's true, but it's success in physics needs to count. But look, even in physics, there are these four fundamental forces: these strong and weak electromagnetic force, the strong and weak uh, nuclear force, gravity, and magnetism. And the problem of unifying those forces with a single theory has been my answer. There are heterotic string theory is an option for doing that, but no one has really come up with that. And also unifying the quantum world with the relativistic world. So there's a lot of work that's unknown by physics. But as I said in response to, I didn't get your name, but what was it? Andrew. Andrew? Andrew's question. 
Jeff, what's your name? Jeff. Yes, uh, in response to Andrew's question, um, what was your question? <laughs> So what was your question? Uh, it was basically like, will math be able to explain oh, yeah, yeah. We, sh we shouldn't avoid pressing science as far as it will go as Christians. We should seek to explain things. And I think that's what God calls us to do. I mean, I've heard some theologians uh, argue this way in the Genesis account, when God says, uh, hold the ground, that the sense is, what? Play around with it. Make it beautiful. Have fun. Yeah, is that accurate or not? Okay, not the deeper than my chauffeur. So, am I doing anything to set just at your question? Yeah. Okay.